Hello, everybody. Welcome to, uh, I guess you could call this Connor's Gospel Doctrine class. <laughs> so I was supposed to teach um, in church today, and, uh, and this is such an important lesson. I mean, in my mind, one of the most important lessons um, that there are from the scriptures. And so I had everything prepared. I prepared this a while ago, this lesson. I was amped for it. I think this is super important. It's been 40 years since we last talked about it, since that's the way the curriculum goes. And then uh, our stake presidency decided to uh, cancel the second hour of church today. I guess a virus can spread more easily in a release society room than the chapel. <laughs> so, so I was not able to give this lesson in church. And so maybe some of you already went to church. You already had this lesson but I've been in a lot of Sunday school classes where this lesson is taught, and in my opinion, it is taught wrong, it is glossed over, we miss some of the most fundamental issues in the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, and I always debate every year, like, okay, do I raise my hand and say something? Do I, do I shift this conversation in a different direction than the teacher's taking it? Four years ago, my wife was the teacher, and so she did a great job. But in years past, I've been in a lot of classes where it's like the whole, the war in heaven is such a, a massive part of our faith and uh, understanding the scriptures. And it's so relevant to what is happening uh, in our life today. And so if we don't understand what happened then, we don't have a good handle on what's happening now. And, um, and so I actually, I'm not a teacher, but uh, the teacher often asks me to, to substitute teach. And so that's what happened today, like a week or whatever ago, she asked if I could teach today. And I said, yes, because this is one of my favorite lessons. And so I had everything prepared and, um, and, and then they shut it down. So I've, I've got some stuff that I want to share and maybe some of this will be useful to you guys. Maybe they glossed over this in your, in your uh, Sunday school if they went over it. But I want to talk about in the book of Moses chapter four and, um, and, you know, the lesson for today goes over a lot of other stuff. I wasn't even going to touch on any of the other stuff. Just focus on this. And so Moses 4 in the beginning, it's talking about the war in heaven and it's talking about agency and what Satan was trying to do. And these verses have so much to unpack and so much relevance that, uh, <clears throat> that I, I want to start there and share a little bit. I wrote a blog post about this years ago. I would maybe modify some of that. Um, it's called, what is it called? I got it right here. Um, a widespread misunderstanding about Satan's war on agency. And so that kind of went viral or whatever, and a lot of people shared it. But I'd probably add a little bit more um, if I were to write it again. And I've, I've talked a little bit about this in uh, Christ versus Caesar, my latest book. Um, I talked a bit more about it in Latter-day Liberty, my first book. But I got a few things that, that I want to kind of get off my chest and share with you guys today because it, it, it's the quote about, like, those who don't learn from the past are, are doomed to repeat it. And so those who don't learn about the war in heaven are doomed to like repeat it, you know, here today too. It's, it's the same thing. If we don't understand what happened then, we don't really understand uh, what's going to happen now. So I'm very quickly going to read these four verses. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about what I think is a more correct uh, interpretation and understanding of what this means. So this is in um, Moses 4. So it says, I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, that Satan whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten is the same, which was from the beginning. And he came before me. So this is Lucifer, right? Uh, Behold, here am I, send me, and I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost. And surely I will do it, wherefore give me thine honor. But behold, my beloved son, who was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man. Okay, so that's, that's critical. We're going to talk about what that means. Uh, sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him. And also that I should give unto him mine own power. By the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down. He became Satan, the father of all lies, etc. Okay, there is so much to unpack there. And one of the big problems is that there have been highly uh, conflicting statements um, in decades past by certainly members of the church, but even leaders of the church. And I'll share a couple in just a moment where it's led to what I believe is a, 
a misunderstanding about what agency is and what it actually means. What's very common, very common in the church, is to hear people claim that Satan wanted to and wants to force us to be righteous. We hear that all the time. Satan's plan is force, and Satan wanted to force us to be good. There is literally not one scripture that says that. Not one. And yet that is like the cultural interpretation, right, of, of what was happening, of, of what Satan wanted to do. That is, that is what so many members of our faith conclude and share and spout and believe. And it's like if you put a ladder against a building, right, the wrong building, every step you take on that ladder is going in the wrong direction. So if our ladder isn't pointed on the right building, pointed at the right building, every step we're taking is wrong. And so misunderstanding what agency actually is and how Satan sought to undermine it really sets us on the wrong path. So, so what is agency? Agency fundamentally requires three things. You need options to choose from, really under law that says this is right, this is wrong, right? So options to choose from. You need the freedom to choose between those options. And then critically, you need consequences for those choices. So options, freedom to choose, and consequences. So why is agency important? Well, there's this quote I want to share from Marion G. Romney. And uh, so he was a leader in the church and um, he was talking about the importance of agency and why, like, okay, who cares? A lot of people misunderstand it. They get it wrong. Big deal. Um, why is it that big of a deal? So here's what he says. This is uh, Marion G. Romney. He says, uh, he was talking, I think it was in like a priesthood session or something, but uh, it certainly applies uh, more broadly to that. He says, you see, at the time Lucifer was cast out of heaven, his objective was, and still is, to deceive into blind men, to lead them captive at his will. This he does to as many as will not hearken to the voice of God. His main attack is still on free agency. So then he says, we must beware concerning ourselves that we do not fall into the traps he lays to rob us of our freedom. And here's the critical point that I believe too. We must be careful that we are not led to accept or support in any way, any organization, cause, or measure, which in its remotest effect would jeopardize free agency, whether it be in politics, government, religion, employment, education, or any other field. It is not enough for us to be sincere in what we support. We must be right. That to me is why it's so important to understand this stuff because so many members of the church, in my opinion, misunderstand it and then they're good people and they go about voting for all kinds of stuff that is extremely problematic or they support politicians or they you know, hold ideas or whatever that are antithetical to <laughs> the very doctrines they claim to espouse because they don't really understand them that well. And so it's not enough that we can be sincere that, oh, we just have a difference of opinion and I, I prefer this and you prefer that and I like this, you know, political uh, party or leader or policy or whatever. It's like, if that stuff is in any way jeopardizing the agency of individuals, then it's problematic. You can't just be sincere in your support or anything. You have to understand how this stuff comports with the gospel if it does. So it's critical in my mind that, um, that we get it right. There's a quote decades ago, I haven't pulled up, but from the First Presidency where they say, Satan is oper operating today under such disguise that people don't even know, right? And I think a large part of that is this idea that we, we don't understand how he's um, operating, right? If we think that he's going around trying to force people to be righteous like he did in the war in heaven, like you're looking in all the wrong places and you're not going to see what's actually happening, because Satan has never done that. That's never what the adversary has done. There's no scriptures to support that at all. So then if we're thinking, oh, you know, policies that force us to choose, you know, something, like that's, that's not what it's about. And we'll get into that. Okay, so the quotes. Look, I, I, uh, I approach things a bit different. I even say this when I teach gospel doctrine too. So it's not like I try and hide this. And I don't hide it on Facebook either. But I have a very strong testimony, but I have a different testimony, I feel like, than a lot of members of my faith. Um, I'm okay with a church where leaders are wrong and say wrong things and hold views that are incorrect. I, I have a grace, I guess you could call it, for imperfect mortals trying their best and well-intentioned. I don't ascribe any malice, but... Um, 
this cultural perception that, that leaders are kind of infallible or always prophetic and always saying what God wants them to historically is inaccurate and therefore we can conclude is inaccurate right now as well, which is why the spirit of discernment is so critical so we can really try and understand what's right and what's wrong and not just believe that whatever we're told is right because historically it hasn't been and I think it's reasonable to c conclude that it's that way today. So as I share these quotes, I don't want to be like, oh, you know, the church is wrong or they were idiots or like, no, it's, it's, you know, people are on their own progression and um, cultural pressures have been very strong to believe a certain way and articulate things a certain way in past years. And so in sharing these quotes, it's not like, like, let's dump on them and they're idiots, right? It's just that like, look, these different ideas have been out there. And I think that is what has led to the misunderstanding. So I want to start with Ezra Taft Benson, who I think has am amazing quotes on a lot of issues. But I think he's one of the culprits in perpetuating this idea that it was about force, that Satan's plan was to force us to be righteous. I think a lot of uh, people in my kind of political uh, end of things, right, have a great affinity for Benson. They see him as a big freedom fighter. And then his his persuasion versus force stuff, which has been great in, in politics, when it got pulled over into this agency war in heaven stuff, it didn't quite really jive, in my opinion. So he says, this is uh, Ezra Tap Benson. He says, the central issue in the pre-mortal council, the war, in, or not the war yet in heaven, but the pre-mortal council was this. Shall the children of God have untrammeled agency to choose the course they should follow, whether good or evil, or shall they be coerced and forced to be obedient? Okay, so he's saying explicitly there, the question in the pre-mortal council was agency or force people to be obedient. That's what Ezra Taft Benson said. He says, Satan stood for the latter, coercion and force. So that quote, which many people know it was you know, widely shared and widely read, I think is what in large respects contributed to this misunderstanding. Here's another one. This is from James E. Faust, who was in the first presidency. He said, uh, he's talking about uh, the, the scriptures that we just read, Moses 4, right? Uh, when Lucifer's like, give me thy honor, not one soul shall be lost, blah, blah, blah. So then James E. Faust says, this he proposed to do by force destroying the free agency of man. And then he later says in the same address, free agency given us through the plan of our father is the great alternative to Satan's plan of force. Force, 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 right? You're seeing a theme. Okay, a couple more. Uh, and there are others, but this is uh, N. Eldon Tanner, who I think was in the first presidency, uh, if I'm remembering right. Um, but he's one of the top leaders. This was in 1973. He says, Lucifer, a son of the morning, came forth with his plan to redeem all mankind by force, that not one soul would be lost for which he wanted the honor. Force, more force, right? Here's Hubie Brown. During this anti-mortal existence, or pre-mortal, in a council in the heavens with God, the Father on the throne, there was one who challenged God, desiring to usurp his power and force all men to do his bidding. So... Forces everywhere. Satan wanted to force us. Force us to be obedient. Force us to be righteous. All this kind of stuff. Again, there's no scripture that supports this at all. And then, on the other hand, we have quotes like this. Here's J. Reuben Clark, who was in the First Presidency. He said, As I read the scriptures, Satan's plan required one of two things. Either the compulsion of the mind, the spirit, the intelligence of man, or else saving men in sin. Hmm. We'll get more into that. But here he's saying, there's a different line of thinking here. It's not just about compulsion, coercion, force. It could be saving men in sin. Okay, J. Rubin. Uh, the church's own institute manual said, I, don't, I think it's been updated since, so this may be a previous version, but it said, most people think <laughs> that Satan would have forced us to do right. So here's the institute manual itself admitting that there's this cultural misperception, this doctrinal misunderstanding in the church. Most people think that Satan would have forced us to do right, but that is only one possibility. Certain conditions are necessary if we are to have agency. Satan might have destroyed our agency by eliminating any one of those conditions, and he's still trying to destroy it using the same techniques of deception and lies. Okay, interesting. Here's the Bible uh, dictionary, again, kind of canonized or official whatever from the church, under the war in heaven uh, section. It says... 
Um, it was evident that if given agency, some people would fall short of complete salvation. Lucifer and his followers wanted salvation to come automatically to all who passed through mortality without regard to individual preference, agency, or voluntary dedication, which is literally what it says in Moses. I will redeem all mankind. I'll save everyone. Not one soul shall be lost. So this is correct, except here it's saying that they wanted salvation to automatically come to all. It's focusing on that issue. Nowhere does it say forcing people to be righteous as a means to get there. One final one I'll share. This is uh, Bruce R. McConkie. Uh, it says, uh, Lucifer and his lieutenants sought salvation without keeping the commandments, without overcoming the world, without choosing between opposites. So, so on the one hand, we got this like forced righteousness theory when it comes to agency. And on the other hand, we have this, what I call the eat, drink, and be merry option, um, which obviously we'll, we'll get more into in just a minute. We're all, I think a lot of us familiar with that scripture, but it implies so much more. And this idea that Bruce R. McConkie and the manual and the Bible dictionary and J. Reuben Clark are saying, which is that Satan wanted to save people in their sins. Okay. So if I was actually teaching the class, I wouldn't be just going through all this. There'd be interaction and I'd have more time to kind of figure out transition and go into the next thought because someone else would be talking. But um, so I'm going to, I want to unpack bit by bit this Moses four, because this is where we, I think, start to get into the nuance and the, the kind of deeper understanding about what was actually happening. Um, so in Moses four, he says, uh, I will redeem all mankind. That's what Lucifer says, right? So the question I have, and that I would ask you guys if you were in my class, is what is redemption? So if, if Lucifer is saying, I will redeem all mankind, then I think we need to ask, what, what was he actually saying? What, why the word redeem? What does that actually mean? Well, the standard dictionary definition is redemption means Rescue from bondage, regain possession of something that was lost. Okay, so this implies that under Lucifer's plan, that there would be sin. Because you can't have redemption, you can't, have, you can't reclaim from bondage or something that was lost, uh, a person who isn't in bondage of sin or who was not lost from you know, God's presence. So that means that Satan's plan had choice. Because without choice, you can't have sin. Without law, you can't have sin. And the freedom to choose. Because if they were coerced to choose that, then there's no um, redemption needed. Because they themselves weren't at fault for anything. So, so under a system of compulsory obedience, then redemption is unnecessary. It just doesn't make sense um, at all. Redemption only is needed in an environment when people can make wrong choices. And when they make bad choices, when there is law, when there is choice, when there is freedom to choose those things. Um, it's also interesting that he says, I'll redeem all mankind, right? Not most, not, not a lot or whatever. It's, you know, even the vile sinners. And so where God says, no unclean thing can return to my presence, it's this question of like, okay, redemption is needed. Even Satan was talking about redeeming people, that there would be people becoming unclean and therefore needing to be redeemed, Right? God's plan was not everyone's going to make it or not everyone's going to, you know, choose the right outcome. Lucifer here is saying, I'm going to redeem all mankind. He says, one soul shall not be lost. So if we're forced to be righteous, then what's the point of mortality? What's the, what's the point at all, right? Do we get blessings from forced charity? Uh, is compulsory tithing okay? I mean, what would, what would it be like to have mandatory prayer? Um, you don't get blessings from these things. There's no benefit. There's no point to mortality if individuals were to be compelled to be obedient and righteous and then return. There's no redemption needed, but also there's really no point to mortality. It frustrates God's entire plan to have a system of coerced obedience because it deprives people of the opportunity to experience different things and to have the the blessings and the progress that comes from choosing yourself to choose something good over something that's bad. Okay, so then he says, and I see there's a question or two, so hopefully I'll, I'll get to those in a minute. Um, I think it's easier in person to kind of deal with questions and flow, and I think it's a little bit more 
uh, tough on, on social. So I think I'm just going to share a few more ideas and then I can uh, scroll back up. So he sought to destroy the agency of man. Okay, so, so how do you do that? How do you destroy the agency of man? Um, well, it was the Institute Manual, I think is what I shared, that says, you know, Satan can do it in, you know, different ways. Like, we know we need choice, we need freedom to choose, and we need consequence. So was Lucifer proposing to remove good and evil? That there wouldn't be good and there wouldn't be evil? I, I think... I think there's a maybe there, but but probably no, because if there's uh, redemption, then that means there is good and evil, right? There are different choices. He just wanted to redeem all mankind. And so redemption implies that there is good, there is evil. He's not removing choice. He's not even removing law, God's law. He's just redeeming everyone, okay? So I don't think that prong of agency is what gets undermined um, in Satan trying to destroy the agency of man. So did he propose removing choice? Does, does any scripture at all, I, I haven't, I've studied this issue a lot over the past decade or so. I cannot find, and I can't find anyone else who can find any scripture anywhere in any of the standard works, anything that says that Satan wanted to coerce obedience. This, this, force thing that many leaders and certainly way more members have uh, believed and advocated. So I think that's a misunderstanding. I, I think, like, I, I don't know where that came from, if it's a bleed over from, you know, coercion inherently being wrong and uh, inconsistent with God's commandment to love others, and therefore that is anti-Christ and therefore satanic. But that's not, as I read any and every scripture, that's not how Satan was trying to undermine our agency. So yes, force is wrong, that's evil, no question. But is that how Satan was and is operating to get us to choose him over God? I don't know of any scripture that says that. Um, so that means we have choice and law, good and evil. It means we have the freedom to choose, even under Satan's plan, because we don't find him anywhere saying that he's gonna coerce us to choose good over evil. So that leaves the third option, which is consequences of choice. So this to me is, it's the eat, drink, and be merry option. This is what Satan was doing, Lucifer. This is what Satan's doing today. This is what we see throughout the political process. This to me is like the big aha about what the war in heaven was about and how that war is being fought today and how we need to be on guard for what is going on in our world. So maybe I'm not going to share all of these. In fact, I don't think I will. I, by the way, like I continue to love my remarkable, this thing is amazing. Um, uh, so I, I have all these notes here about different interactions of people with Satan. I'll just run through them quick rather than like spend time on each. Cause in class we have an hour. I don't want to do this for a full hour. Um, so here's just drive by examples. So Nihor, this is an Alma one. He's the first to commit priestcraft. He said that all would be saved in their sin, no matter what. No, no sin, effectively, no consequence. It was a popular religion. Years later, the sons of Mosiah were preaching to the Amalekites and the Amulonites, and they were all, the, the Book of Mormon says, they were all Nehorites. This religion of Nehor persisted after Nehor was, was preaching this. And it was a gospel of eat, drink, and be merry. It was do whatever you want. We're all gonna be saved. Okay, that was very appealing to people. Korahor, right, who later admitted he was deceived by Satan. He's the Antichrist. This is in Alma 30. Well, what was he saying? He wasn't forcing righteousness to the Nephite faith. There was no force, right? It was like, oh, there is no law, no consequence. Do whatever you want, right? That was the gospel that, that he was preaching. Um, well, I guess gospel is good news. Well, again, some people perceive that to be good news because they can like get away with things, right? Sherem in Jacob 7 saying there's no Christ he said many things that were flattering, leading many hearts away. He's not preaching force. Hey, guys, come listen to me, and I'm going to force you to choose the right, and I'm going to make you be obedient to God, right? No, it's, it's like, oh, do whatever you want. Come, you know, fund me and pay me to preach to you, to your soothing ears, this gospel of ease and convenience where you can do and believe whatever you want and still be saved. That is what Sharon was up to. Flattery, of course, is common throughout the scriptures. Um, 
I've got a whole bunch of scripture citations I won't even share, but, but again, flattery is this means through which people entice someone else to believe and support them. And you don't flatter people by forcing them. Quite the opposite. You blow smoke up their rear and say, you're doing great. Everything's okay. You're awesome, right? I support you and doing whatever you want to do and speak your truth and all this nonsense. Uh, Zizram, claiming people would be saved in their sins, right? So this is in Alma 11. I, I wrote all these little verse things that I would have read in class. Um, but but he's talking to, um, who was it, Amulek and Alma or, anyway, so Zizram, he's, he's criticizing the church leaders by saying, aha, they said they're trying to, to narrow this vision of God to saving people only um, from their sins, not in their sins. Oh, how awful of you guys to try and narrow God like that. He's, he's trying to say, I imagine a God that can save us even in our sins, and you guys are only saying from our sins. How ridiculous. So again, he's preaching this gospel of like, you can sin, you can do whatever you want and still be saved. Obviously Cain, this is in the next chapter of Moses, right? He talks about murdering and getting gain. He says, quote, I am free, right? He's talking to, to Satan. Satan's saying, oh, I'll let you off the hook. You'll be able to, to murder and get gain. Do whatever you want, gain power, gain control, right? Commit sin and you're free, right? You'll be saved. Everything will be okay for you. Um, eat, drink, and be merry, right? Like that is, and so then Cain becomes Master Mahan, right? And has this oath that throughout the Book of Mormon, we see the people are, that the prophets are trying to bury them. Like it talks about like, you know, prophet passing the, the plates to his son or whatever. And he's like, oh, but not these things over here. Like we don't talk about that. And maybe we have the, the we don't talk about Bruno song that's popular. We, we need a, a version of, you know, we don't talk about Master Mahan and his secret combination, you know, but, but what happens throughout the Book of Mormon is people dig that up. They find out about it. Maybe Satan is directly giving it to people, telling them about the past telling them about these oaths and everything, and then pff, up pops the secret combinations, which befell two entire societies in the Book of Mormon. Gordon B. Hinckley has this great quote where he says that the Book of Mormon is more inspired and inspiring than the morning newspaper in helping us understand what happened and what is happening in our day. And so, and then in, in uh, Moroni 8, right, Moroni says, the Lord commands you that when you see these things, you awake to your awful... Um, uh, situation that you understand what happened in, in these two societies, the lessons that you can learn so as not to repeat them in your own society. And what happens throughout the Book of Mormon with these secret uh, combinations? I mean, Helaman 6 especially, it's all about protecting themselves. They're murdering, they're plundering, they're getting gain, right? And then they're protecting one another with oaths. They're saying, oh, you'll be good. You can do whatever you want and we'll let you off the hook. They change the laws of God to what the Book of Mormon calls the laws of wickedness. So they intentionally are, are investing the government to exempt their buddies and uh, persecute the righteous. And so they are, are using their power to let their buddies off the hook. They are trying to eat, drink, and be merry and get away with it. Um, and then, of course, so, so I got to read this part. Of, of all the ones that I'm going to read, um, it's going to be this one. So this is in 2 Nephi 28. This is where we get kind of the eat, drink, and be merry option. So it's verses 7 through 9. And uh, here's what Nephi says. There shall, oops, sorry. Um, there shall be many which shall say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. And there shall also be many which shall say, eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take advantage of one because of his words, dig a pit for thy neighbor. There's no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we're guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we'll be saved." And Nephi says, there shall be many which shall teach after this manner false and vain and foolish doctrines and shall be puffed up in their hearts and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord like those secret combinations and their works shall be in the dark. So the eat, drink, and be merry option in my mind is the answer. Like think of the war in heaven, okay? In our theology, we believe that God has populated and created numerous worlds. The earth is not the only planet that has his children, which Tangentially, I always find really interesting because for us, we have to have faith and believe that this guy named Jesus was born over 2,000 years ago and did all this stuff in 
uh, you know, Jerusalem and throughout Israel, lived, died, resurrected, and all of that. That's kind of what our faith requires us historically to believe that those things happened a couple thousand years ago. God's children on other planets, as I understand things, because I don't know or believe or think that anything supports the idea that there was a Christ on each planet or that Christ, uh, you know, had an atonement and a life on each planet. Uh, I, I think the stronger argument for our theology is that um, all of God's children on all those other planets, part of their theology requires that they believe in aliens effectively and, and that there was this guy Jesus on one of God's other planets who lived and died and suffered for our sins and was resurrected and all this kind of stuff. So, um, of course, I believe and I think the scriptures even say, right, other sheep I have which are not this fold, I have to gather them so they're one shepherd. And we believe and know that that was Christ coming to the Americas and visiting the Nephites and presumably people uh, all around the world, different uh, branches of the house of Israel that had been broken off in centuries past. But I think there's an argument to, to say that that same verse about Christ, resurrected Christ, having to visit uh, these other folds so that they would have one shepherd implies that he visited people on other planets too, God's children elsewhere. So why do I say all that? Because I'm imagining a, a pre-mortal council, such as we call it, right, with all of God's children. How many children, spirit children, did and does Heavenly Father have, right? So like even on our own planet, what's the population right now? Like, what is it? World population. Um, okay, we're just on the precipice of 8 billion. So that's 8 billion right now. And then you go back a few generations and there was 7 billion alive back then and 6 and 5 and 4 and 3 and 2. And, and so throughout history, there have been and will be tens of billions of people. And then there's other planets. Who knows how many? I mean, we could be talking trillions of individuals. So let's just run with that number. Let's say in the pre-mortal council, there were trillions of, of God's children listening, watching this kind of back and forth, Heavenly Father, Lucifer, Jehovah, all this stuff, right? So think in your mind, you're there, you're one of trillions, and you're seeing this Lucifer guy make this pitch, this power play. And we know the scriptures talk about one third of the host of heaven, which, you know, one third may be like 40 days, the number 40, which as I understand things from the Hebrew, it's kind of a number that just means a lot. So a third, I mean, who knows if it's actually a third, but you know, we got to run with that. It, it was a substantial, massive, massive portion, which itself might be trillions of people, if not hundreds of billions or tens of billions of people are deciding to follow Lucifer. Why? Why? You're there, you're listening, you, you're, you're watching the power play unfold. How might you, how might your spirit brothers and sisters have been enticed to follow that guy? We've lived with Heavenly Father, we've seen his power, blah, 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 all these things, right? We've lived in heaven for a long time, not knowing any different. Why would anyone follow Lucifer? Would a single person follow a guy who stands up and says, vote for me and I will force you to be righteous. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna compel you to do what I think is right and what God says. And you know, your life is gonna be one of coercion and I'm gonna make you do the right thing so that you get to come back. Does that entice anyone? <laughs> like, I can't imagine a scenario in which people follow a guy like that who says, follow me and I'll force you. Not one, which I think is in part why there's not a single verse that I have ever been able to find that supports that idea of force uh, being the critical issue in the war in heaven and the way that Satan, Satan sought to undermine the war in agency. Um, what I think is enticing, what is certainly enticing in this world, we saw it in the scriptures with seed combinations, we see it all over the place, all over the place, is the eat, drink, and be merry option. It's someone standing up and saying, vote for me, and you can do whatever you want. You know, vote for me and we'll have vending machines, you know, in the high school cafeteria. Vote for me, we'll have free health care. Vote for me, I'll, you know, bail you out if you make any mistakes. Vote for me, you can eat, drink, and be merry, and you're going to be saved. How's that for an insurance policy, right? Here's Heavenly Father telling you that only some of you are going to make it back. And that's so unjust, that's so mean. We want everyone back. We want to be inclusive. We love all of you. 
We want everyone to be, be able to come back. Ours is a message of inclusion and opportunity and love and friendship. You know, follow me and all your friends and all your family are going to be able to come back. And everything will be peachy keen and there won't be any hardship and everyone will come back and everything will be happy and peachy and kosher, right? That is an enticing message. That is a reason why billions, trillions of people would follow someone else. And that is the message that we see happening in this world today. That is the message where we see uh, people advancing evil policies. And I don't think they're evil people. I think they're evil policies that would undermine agency. Why? Not by removing options or choice, not by removing the freedom to choose, not by even removing law and God's law, but by removing consequence or attempting to, right? They can't ultimately remove consequence, but that is what they're trying to do. They're preaching this gospel where eat, drink, and be merry, and you'll be saved in your sins. That was Korahor, that was Nehor, that was Sherem, right? That was uh, Alma the Younger at one point, right? It was the secret combinations. It's all these guys preaching this idea of like, oh, ignore God, ignore all that stuff, right? I'm telling you that you can eat, drink, and be merry, do whatever you want, you'll be saved in your sin, things will be great. That is a counterfeit gospel that is enticing today. It is the basis of so much political corruption, right? Because it responds to our fallen nature. It responds to this, this inherently human nature and maybe even divine nature because so many people were deceived and followed that line of thinking before. So it's something in our divine, you know, pre-human nature, you could say, that entices us to want to have the easy path, to want to be able to do whatever we want, and, you know, kick up our legs at the end of the day, be saved, and, and everything will be fine. It's, you know, so in DNC 1, if you remember the Doctrine and Covenants, um, there were a bunch of revelations already, the Book of Commandments. And then the Lord gave what is now Section 1, this new revelation that was intended to be put at the beginning, even though chronologically it came later. And, uh, and so here I want to read this too. Um, Doctrine and Covenants. I would pull it up on my phone, but I'm using my phone to... Um, to record. Okay, so this is in Doctrine and Covenants 1. It's verse 16, and it's what God, how, how God is describing things at the dawn of the restoration, or you might say at the, the sunset of the, um, the apostasy, that for a long time people have been without the gospel. They haven't had, you know, the full truth. And so what is the state of affairs? Here's what God says. This is in DNC 116. He's talking about humanity, and he says, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but Every man walketh in his own way after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world. And then he says it's idolatry and Babylonian and all these things. So everyone is wandering in, not on the straight and narrow, right? They're, they're wandering all over the place. They're following themselves. They're speaking their truth right? It's a subjective morality. You think what's right for you, just, you know, whatever. There's no fixed compass. There's no fixed path. There's no nothing. God is saying every man is walking in his own way. That is the byproduct of a message that is eat, drink, and be merry. It's do whatever you want and you'll still be saved. There's no right. There's no wrong. You know, you don't have to choose what's good. I'm not going to force you to be good. You know, you can choose this other stuff. And if you think that's good for you, then good for you, right? That's the type of message that we see today. And then like, this is why I think it's enticing, right? Because we read in Helaman 6, where you've got the secret combinations that are really, really um, like accelerating their, their kind of infestation of the Nephite society, certainly the Lamanite society. And you've got this core group of Nephites, God's people that are really committed to the gospel. And they're encircling circling the wagons, basically, and all their supplies, and they're trying to starve people out of the mountains, and all this kind of stuff is happening, Right? And so here's what, uh, this is Helaman 6.24. It says, whosoever of those, wait, am I reading the right one? Helaman, sorry, Helaman 6.38. And it came to pass on the other hand that the Neph, so let me actually go back a verse. So verse 37, it came to pass that the Lamanites did hunt the band of robbers of Gadianton, and they did preach the word of God among the more part, wicked part of them, insomuch that this band of robbers was utterly destroyed from among the Lamanites. Why? They're preaching the word of God, they're showing them there are consequences of their actions, that they're choosing wrong, they will be held accountable, and so they destroy the secret band within the Lamanites. Then it says in verse 38, on the other hand, that the, that the Nephites did build them up and support them, 
beginning at the more wicked part of them until they had overspread all the land of the Nephites and, and this is, I think, is the critical part, and had seduced the more part of the righteous until they had come down to believe in their works and partake of their spoils and to join with them in their secret murders and combinations. This is how God's people, the Nephites, were infested from within, not not dominated from without, not forced to choose something different. They were seduced. They wanted to partake in the spoils. It's very tempting, right? Vote for this thing and you'll get free stimulus or free bailout or free PPP or free healthcare or whatever. Partake in the spoils, right? Undermine other people's agency. Remove consequence. Let's have us, you know, people do whatever they want. And, and that is a message that is seductive. That is a message that to me shows why the secret combinations were able to infiltrate and undermine God's people. That is a message that I think today is extremely seductive. And so to me, this question of um, Marion G. Romney, the quote I shared at the beginning, where he says, again, he says, we must be careful that we're not led to accept or support in any way any organization, cause, or measure, which in its remotest effect would jeopardize free agency, whether it be in politics, government, religion, employment, education, or any other field. The whole reason I wrote Christ versus Caesar a year ago or whenever it was, and I consider that book like the greatest book I've ever written that the fewest number of people have read, <laughs> because, um, which I've been very surprised by, but topic for another day. Um, I was so intent on writing that book because to me, there is no religious bucket and political bucket. There is no family bucket and professional bucket and church bucket, right? There's no way to separate out our belief systems from what God wants us to do. Here's why. Do you know what agency means? Like to me, so agency and stewardship are actually quite synonymous. When you look in the scriptures, they're, they're, um, you can interchange them. And and so we know what a steward is, but we don't often talk about what an agent is. So when we talk about agency, God gave us agency, and agent, we have agency, free agency, we can choose, all this kind of stuff. It's not so that we can choose whatever we want. It's that we are agents, right? We are God's agents. We are supposed to be doing what he would do. If, if I, so I run a think tank, right, a nonprofit, and if I hire a lawyer and I send that lawyer to some meetings to represent me, and to make decisions on my behalf. He is my agent. I have hired an agent who's supposed to do what I want him to do. And there's going to be consequences if he goes and commits to something or buys something or does something that I disagree with. So I'm going to hold him accountable, right? But he has an agency. I have, I have made him my agent. So he has agency. That is how I understand our lives today. We are God's agents. It's not that we have agency to do whatever we want. It's that we're agents. We're supposed to be doing what God has sent us here to do. And so to me, this whole question of the war in heaven and Satan undermining agency, it's that, you know, it, it's the chapter before this one when Satan and Moses are interacting and Moses has this grand revelation and vision and has, he has to be quickened and he has to be able to withstand God's presence. And then Satan comes along and Moses is like, who are you? right? My eyes don't have to be quickened or whatever to behold your glory. You have no glory. And like, who are you to tell me anything? And he's calling Moses son of man, right? He's trying to kind of dethrone him from son of God. Oh, you're just a mortal. You're just a, right? And that to me is Satan is trying to get us to, to choose wrong um, and, and, and choose what we want. Doctrine and covenants one, every man going in his own way. That is what Satan was doing during the apostasy not doing what God wants, not having agency and on a fixed path. It's, it's everyone going in their own path. And so Satan wants to tell us, you have choice, sure. And you have the freedom to choose, sure. But you know what? You can choose whatever you want because there's not gonna be any consequence. There is no God. There is no Satan. Do whatever you want. So he's undermining our agency or he's trying to get us to be bad agents by thinking that we're not gonna be held accountable. It's like telling my lawyer, Someone telling my lawyer, oh, hey, Connor won't care if you, you know, do whatever you want, you know, spend that money, do whatever you want, because Connor won't know and won't care, won't hold you accountable. Suddenly that agent is a free agent <laughs> in the sense that he's going to do whatever he wants because he's not being held accountable, 
That is the message that Satan is trying to send. <sighs> so I, I'm just so baffled at how in our church there is such a, I believe, a misunderstanding. And I'm not saying I'm getting 100% right. Like, I, I, I don't think that Satan never tries to force us to do it. Like, coercion is satanic. Uh, it is antichrist. Um, but as I look around the world today, I can't see any instances in which Satan is trying or anyone is trying to force us to do the right thing. And so if we go around spouting that narrative that that's what the war in heaven was about and that's what Satan's plan was about, we're less able, I think, to accurately diagnose how he's operating today, right? You can't win a war that you don't even know is being fought or if you're on the wrong battlefield or you think it's pretend and people are LARPing in a field and you don't realize it's actual battle. Like if, if you don't understand what's happening, you lose. If you don't understand that there's a war being fought, you've lost the war. And so in my estimation, it's critical to understand what was actually happening in the war in heaven because it helps us understand what's happening today. And it helps us connect the dots that it's not just, oh yeah, you can be a good Mormon and be members of whatever political party you want and support whoever you want and whatever policies you want and you'll still be a good Mormon and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a Latter-day Saint and whatever, whatever, right? You can be a good Christian and vote for all kinds of crap and support wars that go kill your brothers and sisters, you know, in other, uh, other lands. And like, no, you can't, in my view, you cannot be a good Christian so-called and support policies that seek to destroy people's agency, undermine people's agency, right? Empower the Gadiantans of the world, do all these things because that is what the war was all about. That is what things are about today. And if we don't understand that it's all about this eat, drink, and merit, be merry option, then we're gonna continue to be enticed to partake in the spoils of the Gadiantans of our era, right? And support them and uphold them and play into what Lucifer was doing all along, which is trying to get people to walk in their own paths after the image of their own God. I feel like I got all that off my chest now. So I was a little more animated than I may have been in class, but probably not because I get very animated about this topic because I get so frustrated at how this narrative just pervades our church culture that it, Satan wanted to force us to choose the right or to be good. And it's like, there's no scriptures to support that at all. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where Ezra Tapp Benson and the like got this idea and, and who, who started this ball rolling in decades past. But um, there's a book, oh gosh, I don't know if I can find it. Um, there's a book, here, oh, here it is. Uh, so I think you can still buy this on Amazon. So this is what first made me realize after I got off my mission, um, because I had never encountered this idea. So this guy, Greg Wright, wrote a book called Satan's War on Free Agency, where he um, he talks a lot about this similar kind of stuff. And uh, so I read that, and that was the first time I, I was exposed to this idea that it's the eat, drink, and be merry side of things. That's how Satan was trying to undermine agency. And so since then, I've done a lot of my own study. But if anyone's interested, that book kind of encapsulates the ideas pretty well. And then, as I said, I did that blog post a few years ago on the widespread misunderstanding of the, the war in heaven. Okay, wow. So there's a few comments. I don't know. Let me see the first one. As a member who, so Joshua's asking, as a member who also shares your political philosophy, I'd be curious to hear your answer to this question. Given agency is foundational to our beliefs, why then would the modern church say it's okay for people to vote whichever way they feel and not more directly embrace certain positions or directly call out policies church members should not support? Oh, million dollar question, Joshua. Um, I kind of hinted at that a moment ago, um, but to answer it more directly, and maybe I'll say this, more liberally here than I might in a classroom inside a church building <laughs> during an official church meeting. Um, I think there's a couple answers. One, uh, church leaders, though um, well-intentioned and at times or often inspired, are still mortal men who are products of their era. I mean, think the pre, before the priesthood ban, right? Talking about the Negro, they'll never have the priesthood and all these church statements, right? For, from people who grew up in this culture and this environment that, that supported such beliefs and it seeped into their, their doctrinal understanding and what they taught. And so I'm like, look, that can happen today too with political stuff that 
that church leaders who for decades were raised on past statements about do whatever, you know, support whatever you want, members of any political party, you know, you can be a good member, right? Like they were raised and trained that way. And so they kind of perpetuate that belief too. And they've never really challenged it and no one has challenged it for them. Or you have um, people like Oaks and others who are very kind of, you know, fixed in their legal tradition and uh, type of thinking. So I think there's an element there where the, they're a product of the culture uh, as we all are to believe and act and think in a certain way. Um, the other part of me thinks that we're running into kind of a, oh, how do I say this? A um, kind of a Moroni ether type scenario. So all in the scriptures, there's examples where, uh, or even Nephi, right? Nephi gets these revelations and the Lord says, nope, you can't give it to people, right? They're not ready or uh, they were, they did have the opportunity, but now I have to take it from them. And Ether's coming out of his cave and he, see, you know, he wants to go out and preach and the Lord's like, nope, they had their chance. Um, you know, now, so part of me feels like notwithstanding me sharing an Ezra Taft Benson quote that got it, I think, wrong. Um, part of me feels like more broadly to your question, political parties, political policies, like we kind of had our chance during the David O. McKay, Ezra Taft Benson type era where it was, you know, constitution and agency and individual freedom and live and let live. And there was more of that element there. And the saints just, you know, ignored it and did the opposite of it and didn't care. And so then I kind of feel like, well, the church kind of had its shot. I feel the same way a lot with preparedness too. It was all big, you know, prepare, prepare. And so I think there's an argument to be made that um, when the Lord really pushes his leaders to teach a certain message and that message is not received, that that light is kind of taken away and why would it continue if we kind of disregard it? I mean, think about the the sealed, uh, this is a whole nother topic and I love teaching this class too, is the sealed portion of the plates, right? Like we never talk about this at all. There's so much more revelation, but we don't in the church talk about it. Why? Because you know, in the Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about how the early saints were condemned because they were treating lightly, lightly the things that they had received, which was the, it was referring to the Book of Mormon. And, and you know, I mean, it was Benson and others who in the recent era continued to say over the pulpit, we are still under this condemnation today. That condemnation has not been lifted. We're not going to get anything else until we, we, um, follow and utilize, and then the scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenant says, not just to say, but to do according to what I've commanded. And I think that really boils down to a lot of this secret combination agency kind of stuff. The Book of Mormon, though a testament of Jesus Christ, is literally a warning manual about how Satan operates and what we need to avoid in our era. And if we read it as Benson wants to flood the earth, and then Gordon B. Hinckley challenged everyone to read the Book of Mormon, and all these great things... But in my mind, part of that, or a large part of that, was to get members to kind of wake up to the warning manual site and not just write in their journal, feel lovey-dovey, that I, I counted all the references in the Book of Mormon to how many times it talks about Jesus. And like, that's all amazing. And I do that, and I think it's important, and I think it's critical. But we're, we're like disregarding the other half of the Book of Mormon because it's icky, it's negative, it's I don't know what. But like, to, to just disregard and not try and apply in our modern era all of those warnings means that we are treating lightly the Book of Mormon. So I, I feel like the Lord is like, yeah, I tried and you didn't listen. So now we'll just have the milk of the gospel rather than the meat of the gospel. And we get the leaders that we deserve. So I would love to have a pulpit pounder and someone who goes up there and says, this is right and this is wrong and, you know, stay away from that policy. And this is antichrist and, you know, this, you know, court ruling or administration, you know, is, is, um, undermining people's agency, blah, 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 you know, attacking bailouts and whatever abortion. I mean, like, you know, for consensual sex to, to like, I can't think of one more profoundly disgusting way of trying to avoid the consequences of your action than to kill a, a, a human life because you want to be exempted from the consequences of your voluntary action. Like, I am so frustrated that our church does not speak out more about abortion and has this milk toast uh, answer. Like, sure, there's nuance. Sure, there's rape and incest and whatever, but it is so extremely minor. And our church should be the most pro-life of all churches. <laughs> I, I, a topic for another day, but... But, uh, but yeah, the answer I think is either that uh, they're the product of their culture and the culture kind of thinks that way and so they think that way. And so despite being inspired in some ways on other things, on these types of issues, they're just regurgitating the cultural, like you can be a good Christian and 
do whatever you want and principles consistent with the gospel can be found in any political party. Like, okay, maybe like one or something, I don't know. But people imply that like, oh, the, all political parties are okay, no matter what they all support, even though that statement should probably be read more narrowly to say like, eh, there's maybe that one statement there is consistent with the gospel. And okay, so Joshua, hopefully there's an answer there. Let's see what else we got. Uh, Spencer Hinckley, wouldn't telling people how to vote violate agency in the first place and defeat the purpose of your argument? So I guess the hard part with me replying to comments after the fact is I'm, I'm not remembering the context in which that question was asked. Uh, oh, let's see. It was a reply to that previous comment about that Joshua left. Wouldn't telling people how to vote violate? I don't think telling people how to vote violates agency because there's no force. Even you can argue, oh, well, church leaders, and then you're being unrighteous and not following the prophet if you're, but like, I don't think it's force for, for, you know, President uh, Nelson to say, I urge you to wear masks and, you know, get vaccinated. Like some people have been like, oh, the church is forcing. No, it's not. Like, you know, even a thus saith the Lord, I don't think really is forced. You could argue that, oh, well, you don't get blessings or you, you don't get back into heaven if you don't. I just don't think it really is that clear cut. So I don't think telling people how to vote um, violates agency. Um, all right, Courtney, totally agree with you. Me and my husband discuss this often. It makes much more sense that Satan would remove consequences. Uh, Jeffrey's replying to Joshua. Pretty sure there aren't any political parties that match gospel principles. That's right. And there's David talking about that statement from the church. Um, let's see. A lot of those are replies, it looks like. Let me see if there's that. We need to learn to think for ourselves, Gina. Absolutely. Desiree says, and we would have understood that the plan came with little to no learning experience. Exactly. Satan's plan would not have, if we we're all redeemed, then again, what's the point? Leah says, I think that watching Satan question what Eve had heard father say in the Garden of Eden was enough of a question to cause her to question what she heard. It wouldn't surprise me if she questioned her own thoughts after hearing Satan. Yeah, and, and part of me wonders too, is like we've got this like, we got some scripture and we got this like, like uh, I don't know, maybe you can call it like a cultural understanding of what happened in the Garden of Eden, but there was so much more said and done in the Garden of Eden that I would love to have like a line by line you know, because I think a lot of what we have is just this really like the essence or this figure, not figurative, but uh, totally figurative, but like this, uh, maybe even allegorical or like a, I don't know. I just think to to be a fly in the wall in the Garden of Eden and to see the the deeper substance and um, and and insights and understanding, like when you know Eve is kind of having these epiphanies and everything, would be super interesting because I think there's going to be so much more uh, depth there. All right, Jared is asking, what about Lucifer being the older brother and straight up rebelling that Christ, the younger brother, was selected as a savior instead of him? The lies he uses are important to understand, but knowing why he rebelled, knowing the truth is important as well. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking about Lucifer being the older brother. I don't think that's scriptural or doctrinal. Um, and uh, and again, like it's it's one thing for someone to rebel for whatever reason. It's another thing to preach a message that gets potentially trillions of people to follow you. An angry brother, you know, upset that he didn't get his lunch money or whatever, right? Is not a reason why trillions of people would follow this guy and forfeit their mortal estate and, uh, and, and risk and receive eternal damnation. Like that's a very high bar. And, and sure, you know, they probably didn't fully understand what was happening. It's a question of like how, informed they were since they did not experience mortality yet and didn't really understand its benefits and, and whatever. So that's an interesting question. But again, like for us, the operative question is, how did Lucifer deceive and, and gain the following of potentially trillions of people? And that question, I think, drives us towards an answer that is, it's not about force. It's about do whatever you want and you're good. Um, uh, Nancy says, I need to study up on the second anointing. I have, thank you. Uh, interesting topic for sure. Uh, Jared says, if knowing why matters, then what motivated Satan to rebel? What if it had to do with Adam Michael being made the first man? It's consistent with others losing their birthright to younger brothers. And if I, eh. again, it doesn't satisfy the issue of trillions of people following him. It's we can't look at just Satan's rebellion on its own. It's the implications of that rebellion and what happened afterward. So sure, it's interesting to kind of say what motivated Satan to rebel. Well, 
God says in, in Moses, right, that he wanted his glory, which is his power. He later says, you know, my glory, which is my power. So, so it was a power play. Satan wanted power. He was um, envious, you might say. Uh, he had a lust for power. Um, and, you know, when I first wrote that blog post years ago, one of the pushbacks was like, oh, it, it could be a number of things. Satan doesn't just commit himself only to one single thing, right? This consequence free, whatever. He could be employing all the, and I say, absolutely, right? Like he's kind of a throw a mud against the wall and see what sticks kind of guy. Like whatever can take Connor down, I'm going to use that. Maybe Connor does, you know, is, is most susceptible to being forced, Right. So maybe I'll do that or maybe I'll have someone, you know, preach this tempting like eat, drink and be merry thing or, or maybe I'll, you know, uh, I don't know. But my point is, I agree with this idea that Satan uses a lot of tricks and and tries to probably customize things to the person. Like, I, I don't think it's a one size fits all. But again, how do you deceive trillions? How do you gain a following of trillions? How do you how do you take down entire societies like the secret combinations did? How do you get God's people to be seduced, right? And and to join you in your satanic activities? That is is our question. To me, it's less interesting, though still important to say, why did Satan rebel? I, I think that's an interesting academic exercise, theological discussion. I'm on board to talk about it. But in terms of its implications and, and what we need to be on, on watch for today, I think the more important question is, how did he get trillions of people to follow him? And how does he get people to follow him today? Um, prophets, David says, have other sources than scriptures on which to draw for truth. I wouldn't demand they limit themselves. Sure, so the argument is, are they saying something that's been revealed to them or are they furthering um, their own uh, perceptions. And that's an interesting question because I think culturally in the church, it's like, you know, um, whatever is said is is prophetic and from God. And I personally don't believe that. Again, I think the historical record is more clear that lots of things have been said and believed and articulated that weren't in fact right. So uh, in fact, church leaders themselves have said that members should not just be assuming that everything is from the prophet, that we need to be pondering and praying and, and seeking our own understanding. Um, yeah, Chris, uh, abortion is a, is a, um, is a good hill to die on with how much tragedy is happening. Okay. So that, that wraps it up. Um, as Sean's talking about mass formation psychosis, uh, a, a important topic of late that, uh, the Google search results have, uh, significantly increased on. So, so what does all this mean? To me, this means, it, again, it's this, the, it's the, it's not just a theological issue. It's a political issue. It's an economic issue. Um, it's a it's a interpersonal issue. It's a geopolitical it, like, um, you know. I remember. Do you remember when Ron Paul was running for president? I think this was in the twenty twelve race, and he's on stage in South Carolina with uh, all the other Republican candidates. So it's this very Christian conservative, you know, community and audience, and uh, they're talking about war. And you've got, you know, the Newt Gingriches and Mitt Romneys or whoever, they're all like, you know, bomb them and kill them and all these things, right? And then Ron says something like, uh, you know, I happen to believe in the golden rule. And I think it applies, you know, he's basically saying to nations as much as individuals. And how would we like it if China, you know, came and did to us what we're doing, you know, in Yemen or Libya or Afghanistan or whatever? And do you remember, like, you can, you can find this YouTube clip, um, if you haven't seen this video or if it's been a while and just Google like Ron Paul, South Carolina, um, debate. And, uh, and he was booed. He was booed by a, a predominantly, I would argue, Christian audience, given the demographics of that area and political party. And he was booed for trying to apply the golden rule to, uh, to, to geopolitics because so many people want to compartmentalize their faith. Again, this is why I wrote Christ versus Caesar. I don't know if I, here, let me grab a copy. So, ta-da! Okay, so if you haven't seen this book, I wrote that last year. So Christ versus Caesar. And I wrote that book because to me, um, we are no better than the Pharisees. You can see my hole in my sweat. This is like my oldest sweatshirt that's falling apart and time to get it, but it's from my hometown. So holding on to it. Good for a lazy Sunday. Um, to me, we are no better than the Pharisees, collectively. To me, Jesus 
preaching that everyone's a bunch of hypocrites and, you know, all these Jews were inconsistent in applying their faith to their actions is a message that is equally, if not more applicable in our day. And so as I look around at Christianity more broadly, and to use that example from Ron and, and the golden rule, it's like people want to like go to worship services on Sunday and narrowly confine, you know, the gospel to just being nice to people. And then I can go vote for whoever I want and support killing whoever I want and support whatever policy I want. And, and they're hypocrites. I mean, the, the actual word of hypocrisy, right? To like put on a mask, like I've got my Christian mask on, right? And now I've got my Republican or whatever mask on. And, um, and again, I don't think there's a political bucket and a religious bucket. I think there's one bucket. And if we are trying, if we claim to believe in a theology that requires us to believe and take certain positions as ours does, and then we go over and Monday through Saturday do whatever we want to do. Then literally we're doing what Doctrine Covenants 1 said, which is every man is walking in his own path or in his own way after the image of his own God. And so what I talk about in Christ versus Caesar is that we are as idolatrous as the children of Israel. When they're in 1 Samuel 8 saying, oh, give us unto a king to be like unto all the other nations, right? And we look at that and we say, oh, you, you idiotic children of Israel, how could you be so silly and stupid? Right? Like, how could you have, like, literally worshipped a golden calf? Are you, are you morons? Right? And then we turn around and do it just as much, if not more so, in our own day. I mean, you look at the response with COVID and all the, like, look, vaccines may be important for you, given your risk and health circumstances or whatever. But the degree to which people of our faith are relying upon the arm of flesh is astounding to me. That, to me, is the biggest sad takeaway. It's not that uh, government leaders are 100% wrong or that the information about the threat of a virus isn't totally manipulated. Like, it, it could all be totally accurate, right? But the degree to which people are, are relying upon the arm of faith and those leaders and those analyses and their prescriptions and their recommendations and the ever-changing CDC position, whatever it is today, right? Relying on the arm of flesh, having fear instead of faith. Like, when was the last time you saw, uh, you know even a church leader, right? Talking about the importance of faith and prayer and fasting and healing and the priesthood and all these things as a means to address this. Maybe not the means. Maybe you could argue, as some of them have, that, that uh, what did they call the vaccine? A literal godsend. I don't know that I believe that, but that has been claimed. And so for me, it's this arm of flesh question. It's, it's this idolatry of the state. It is, it is uh, oh, what does it say in the, the Book of Mormon? It's... Um, worshiping the work of our own hands. And, and so my biggest frustration, if I were to you know, pick one, is that, and I, I'm, I'm guilty too, I'm not up on my rammy umptum here and saying that I'm, I'm perfect at all, but um, as I try and assess things on like a broader social level, right? Not just me or my family or here in Utah where I live or whatever, it's like, where are we going wrong more broadly? And where are we not applying the scriptures? And where, where, what is Christ actually trying to say to us if we read the scriptures with, with the intent to apply them across everything, not just on Sunday or not just in how I treat my neighbor, but in how I treat Yemen or Iran or who I vote for or whether I want to make everyone in my community pay more taxes for a, a park that I want to take my kids to, right? Like what if you applied the golden rule to foreign policy like Ron was doing? President Nelson has a fantastic quote. I think David may have... Uh, even, oh, thanks Spencer for saying that about Christ versus Caesar. Um, yeah, David shared the quote uh, from 2002. This is shortly after 9-11 and there's a fantastic uh, story about that. I don't, I think I get into it briefly in Christ versus Caesar. I wrote it on my blog post where, where the church PR department, okay, so first let me read the statement. Wherever it is found and however it is expressed, the golden rule encompasses the moral code of the kingdom of God. It forbids interference by one with the rights of another. And then here's the kicker. It is equally binding upon nations, associations, and individuals. We don't get an asterisk in following God's commandments when we're doing something through the government indirectly to others, right? That is us doing things to other people just with intermediaries. And so that is a beautiful statement. So I think it was that exact uh, talk. I'm almost uh, confident it is where, where the Associated Press the following morning, oh, I wonder if I can find this. Um, the church PR department started walking this back because there was so much flack. Um, let's see, Associated Press. I wonder if I can find this really quick. 
um, and he had the, or not he, but the church started to walk back the, um, the statement and, and, uh, <laughs> here, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, uh, okay, here we go. So, um, so this was, uh, a, a talk by Nelson, blessed are the peacemakers. And uh, he says, you know, we should renounce war and proclaim. Okay, so this may be a different address, but it was right around the same time. Let's see. Blessed are the peacemakers. Um, I'll have to pull up when this one is. It may be the same talk, actually. Um, but uh, Elder Nelson, then Elder Nelson, he says, we should renounce war and proclaim peace. He said, we should follow after the things which make for peace. We should be personal peacemakers. And then he said, we should live by the golden rule. So then the Associated Press published a brief report stating that the Mormon church issued a strong anti-war message, clearly referring to current hostilities in the Middle East, end quote. One newspaper's headline announced that Elder Nelson had, quote, railed against war, um, even though his remarks didn't have any anger or contention at all. So the church, perhaps for anticipating a PR nightmare or, or who knows what was going into their minds, um, but uh, let's see. Uh, one day after the conference ended, the church's PR division issued a media advisory stating that some news outlets had misinterpreted the address uh, and encouraged reporters and editors to consider the full text. The advisory that the PR department put out emphasized a minor part of the text in which Nelson uh, cited the unchristian uh, cesarean position of the church to urge its members fully to render loyalty to their country including military service. Uh, so even without this exception, Elder Nelson, in my view, correctly condemned wars of aggression and pushed for peace. Um, he said, we cannot fully love God without loving our neighbor. We cannot fully love our neighbor without loving God. The Associated Press then issued a follow-up report titled Mormons Back Bush Middle East Policy, explaining that the church had, quote, qualified Nelson's remarks and, quote, offered support for President Bush's President Bush's policy in the Middle East in the form of an editorial in the church-owned Deseret News. That editorial issued the following Wednesday, so just days after President uh, then Elder Nelson gave this remark, completely contradicted his address. Like 180 degrees different. Here's what it said. Saddam Hussein and the threat he represents to the United States and her allies will not go away on his own. This time, the nation may well have to strike first. It concluded that, quote, Americans have known they must face Saddam again sooner or later. It appears the time has come. So here's Elder Nelson talking about the golden rule and loving God and peace. And the PR department immediately walks it back. Instead of talking about that issue at all, they find this tiny little line in Nelson's remark where he says, oh, loyalty to country and, you know, that type of thing. And that's what they push out there to the public rather than owning you know, what we believe and what he said. And so then the interpretation from the media was, oh, they support President Bush's foreign policy because they're talking about loyalty to country and that's who's running the country. And so that became the narrative. And then the church doubled down through the Deseret News uh, editorial piece, completely contradicting what Nelson was saying with the, the, the golden rule and peace and, uh, and loving others, right? Saying strike first when the Book of Mormon specifically prohibits the use of preventive war. <laughs> like I get asked all the time, you know, how do you still have a testimony and why are you still in the church? And uh, like, I got to find this story. It's been a few years, but I think it was Joseph Smith who was like, he had pissed someone off or something and, and, or maybe it was Brigham, but like, then they say to the person like, Oh, you're going to get upset and leave the church. And the person's like, I think it was Brigham. Cause I think he pissed more people off than Joseph did. But then the person is like, uh, why am I going to leave? This is as much my church as it is yours, you know? So that type of mentality where, like, I, uh, I don't love some of this stuff. To me, it is inconsistent with what God wants us to do. That's why I wrote Christ versus Caesar as kind of a call to action for people in our faith to say, let's have one bucket. Let's be consistent. Let's not compartmentalize Christ over here and have a summer cottage in Babylon over there. And let's not just do whatever we want or support whatever policy and, you know, who cares? Because principles consistent with the gospel may be found in any political party. Like, let's actually try and figure out what Christ wants us to do in all things. In political things, in economic things, in family things, in neighborly things, in church and community things. 
and look, I'm, I am not the best at it. I struggle, right? Um, but I at least want to understand what I ought to be doing and not just validate what I'm already doing. I don't want to eat, drink, and be merry in my political beliefs and think that I can support whoever I want and whatever policy I want, and it will be well with me in the last day, and there won't be any consequences for me voting for all those horrible people and policies, right? Like, that to me is what the war in heaven was about. That to me is what it's about now. And if we think that we can just do whatever we want and support whoever and whatever we want and not have consequences for those beliefs and actions and votes and what we advocate, like, I think we're just up in the night. I think we are completely wrong. And I think we're supported by misinterpretations and cultural traditions that, oh, well, it's not about force. No one's forcing. Right? This is just a democracy and we're just voting for whatever we want. You do you, I'll do me. You go in your way, I'll go mine, right? Like, if we misunderstand what Lucifer was doing then, we don't know what he's doing now. And we fall prey to the same thing and we're being seduced to partake in the spoils and... We sit in Sunday school lessons where no one really talks about this or understands it and don't really hear it anymore in the pulpit. But again, I'm not that upset. I think that's more a condemnation of us than it is our leaders. I think God gives us the leaders that we deserve. I think generations past of Mormons have done a pretty crappy job at this kind of stuff. We're still under condemnation. We're not getting the sealed portion anytime. We've not treated well the things that we've received. We've not really sought to read the warning manual We've only been focused on the feel-good stuff that makes us feel like we're righteous. And it's frustrating. And uh, But it's a big opportunity. It's an opportunity to, you know, help educate other people and have discussions like this. And anyways, thank you for indulging me because when, when they canceled, for those who came late, this was a gospel doctrine lesson that I was supposed to be giving today. Uh, probably with a little less emphasis than I've done here. But uh, but I had prepared a lot to share, a lot more depth than we went into today in terms of reading a bunch of scriptures and really picking them apart. But uh, but our stake president canceled our Sunday school lesson because of COVID, because viruses in a Relief Society room are more a threat than a chapel, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but I was bummed because this is like the lesson. This is such a critical lesson. And then to skip over it and not have it at all and so it's frustrating because it's been four years since we last talked about it, you know, and it'll be another four years before we do again. So um, I want to do something and this was my something. So thank you. And I'll, I'll wrap it up there. I hope you guys have an awesome Sabbath and uh, see you around. Thanks.